on his TV show. He used to play the bass and then talk. And so anyway, please be seated. One more time. He is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. John 11, 23 to 27. I'd like to focus on those words we read a few moments ago. But to get into that thought of resurrection, uh, how many of you have ever been to the University of Tennessee? Uh, maybe watch the movie The Blind Side, Mike Lore. Ole Miss, Tennessee. Uh, which one would he go to? Is his adopted family boosters, backers, you know? But remember the one scene where uh, the tutor challenging Michael Orr? So you're thinking about Tennessee, huh? Do you know about the University of Tennessee, uh, the medical center there? Behind that building, there's a, a lovely wooded lot, and it's kind of situated on a hillside. And people are often seen out there lying in the sun or reclining up under a tree. Little squirrels and other furry woodland creatures are scurrying about. And it's there that, well, a man named Professor Arpad Voss, who is one of the scientists at the University of Tennessee's Anthropological Research Center, he goes out into that field and he sees dead bodies every day. Because all of those folks that are situated out there in the humid Tennessee sun, they're there lying around in that field for a reason. They're very, very much dead. Cadavers intentionally sprawled about for research and study. Study of all things. Get this if you're thinking of going to college. You know, studying the variety of modes of human decomposition. Yeah, the, the people who boldly and nobly donated their bodies to science, and forensic science owes them a debt of gratitude. But Dr. Vass's job and his team's job is to evaluate how the human body decomposes in different situations. Whether, say, for example, in the trunk of a car, or in a plastic bag, or in a dumpster, or submerged in a, a pond or a cesspool. The many different ways you can deposit and dump a body after a murder. And the data they're collecting, well, it's priceless. Researchers and law enforcement, they use all of the data that's being found in this kind of gruesome study to, to help work their cold cases with unsolved murders. And Michael Orr. Those hands might reach up and grab you from under the football field. He didn't go there, by the way. 21st century America, we look at death. We look at it in video. We look at it in music, pop culture, media. While at one side we're kind of fascinated with it, we like to keep it at an arm's length, don't we? We're not real comfortable with the idea of death and dying. You know, we, we think we're comfortable with it. We watch a, a show like maybe, ooh, The Walking Dead, and, when, and the zombies, and the apocalypse, and, and we can laugh about death, and it's so fantastic and unreal, like that would ever happen in a million years. But yet our culture, at the same time, is very afraid of death. We have sanitized death, haven't we? I mean, I look at funeral homes. The practices at a funeral nowadays have changed. We, we don't really like to be that close, do we? Emotionally, physically, we try to protect ourselves from the, the idea of death. In, in our day and age, death is something that, well, you know, it's, it's something that I'd rather just not talk about. Even funeral homes have adapted, I think, the old lens crafter's motto. We can uh, bury your loved ones in about an hour. And funerals, they're not long. Get it in, get it over with, get on with it, move past it, put closure on it, get it out of my life. I'd like to look at all of that from the point of view of death and dying and life and rising. And on a day of all days, the resurrection of our Lord, we look at Lazarus, and we look at the one who says, I am the resurrection and the life. 
I mean, think about it. We in our culture, we try to sanitize death and its ugliness as much as we can, but Lazarus' family, they knew better, didn't they? Jesus knew better. Everybody knew exactly what was going on behind that rolled stone in front of the tomb. Everybody knew what was happening to Lazarus' body. In fact, even in John's Gospel, a little bit earlier, we're told that, that Jesus deliberately chose to wait a few days before going just a couple of miles where he was into Bethany. He waited until after Lazarus had died and had been in the tomb for long enough that he would start to rot and he would start to smell. And when he finally got there, Martha, she was the sister who said, I got a piece to have with him, and went out and said, where have you been? If you had been here, my brother would not be stinking like a corpse in a tomb. And, and so we stopped for a moment. And look at how we celebrate Easter. Pink frosted bunny cakes. And they're good. Jelly beans, many colors. Little yellow chick marshmallows. Plastic grass, colored eggs. And those are all fine little things that we can laugh about and enjoy. But when you look at the Bible and you look at what led up to Easter, the events in Jesus' life that led up to his resurrection, it is more like Halloween, isn't it? I mean, there's talks of corpses and burial clothes and tombs and sepulchers and, and embalming spices and oils. It sounds a lot more like an Edgar Allan Poe story rather than something you'd find in the Bible, perhaps. And, and when we go with those ladies again in heart and mind to that first Easter sunrise, to that tomb. We know exactly what they expected to encounter. It was a ghoulish sight. And why did they go there? Because they intended to make sure that the dead body of their friend and Lord was properly prepared for burial. That's what all the spices and the cloths were all about. They wanted to make sure that he was properly laid in that tomb and that his body was prepared and so it could decompose nicely and when it finally had done the dirty business of, of rotting away, then they could go in and finally take out the bones and the remains and put them in a little ossuary or a, a little bone chest and bury them with everyone else. That's what they were looking for. I mean, the women, the disciples, they expected to find a corpse. What have you come here today to expect to find? This was the same Jesus who said to those same people, face to face, I will rise. He said it in little hidden ways, privately. He said it publicly in very plain ways. Yeah, destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man, you know, he will be in the belly of the grave. After, gentlemen, I have to go to Jerusalem and after I go there, I will suffer many things at the hands of sinful men and they will crucify me and I will die. But after I've risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee and you will see me. And yet it just didn't seem to resonate, did it? And they went to the tomb, not expecting to see a risen Savior, but a fallen teacher. And they went there expecting to find the dead remains, and they didn't need a forensic scientist to tell them how Jesus died. They knew. The Bible says that not a lot of people stood around. They didn't have the stomach to watch Jesus give his last breath. It was that gruesome, that intense. They hadn't seen someone become the object of such wrath and such ridicule who became the object of torture at the hands of the Roman legionnaires in a long time. But Jesus, somehow, he had incurred their wrath. And they made sure they took out every ounce of wrath and their pound of flesh on him. They made a good example of him. And everyone knew, whether they were there to the last or not, you go up a Roman cross alive. You come down dead. 
And Jesus was scourged and beaten and smitten and afflicted, and he was beyond recognition as far as what they had done to him. And everyone knew. Jesus, he went up that Roman cross alive, and he came down dead, and he was buried, and there was a tomb, period, end of story. Can we get on with it? That's why they went to the tomb. Back then, there were no funeral homes to dispense of the dirty work. It was up to family and friends to take care of your remains. That's what the women went to do. Everybody in that culture knew what death smelled like. They knew what death looked like. They knew what death did to a body. They knew what was going on behind, in the dark, in the secret, inside the other side of that, that rolled stone. Everybody knew what happened to everybody who entered a tomb. Everybody knew what happened to every single body that was laid in a tomb. Everybody knew what happened to every person who died until the resurrection, until Easter morning. And when Easter happened, those witnesses saw something unprecedented in the history of human corpses. They saw this one. In the flesh, Jesus of Nazareth had become a former cadaver, just like Lazarus. Oh, and the people of Israel, they had their hopes. Some of them, you know, they believed in resurrection. Some literally, some metaphorically. You know, the Sadducees, they didn't buy any of this. But they hoped somehow that the Lord would resurrect the nation of Israel and put them into the powerful position of being a rival nation in the Middle East like they once had been. And then there was a handful of believers who still looked for life among the dead. But that was a long way down. Even Martha, on the last day, sure. But not in my lifetime. Not with somebody I know, no. Not resurrection for somebody who was so publicly and clearly pronounced dead as Jesus was. But the facts are the facts. And if you watch any history show that tries to unravel the facts and critically study what really happened that Easter morning, Every single one comes to the conclusion something amazing happened because we can't get our heads around the facts, the written record. It doesn't make sense. The way the story plays out, the manner in which those characters in the story acted, you know, if this was made up and fake, why were the disciples hiding in fear of the Jews? Why were they trembling for their own lives? It all points to the truth that facts are facts and what the Bible states is clear is what happened. On Easter Sunday, the tomb was empty. Modern science can't do that. Sure, there was Frankenstein once. He tried, but that didn't end very well, did it? The best maybe somebody could do is hope to, well, I'll donate my organs and maybe... In my death, I can help someone in life. There's only one death, one resurrection in life that benefits all humanity. And that's what happened that Sunday. Oh, a couple days ago, it was Friday. Yeah, there we saw it. Peter was lying. Council was conspiring. People were sitting. Satan was grinning. That was Friday. But Sunday's here. Sunday's come. And we stand in the mouth of that empty tomb and we look in along with those disciples. And what do we see? We see the point Jesus was making to Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. That means, you know what? When you die, your soul doesn't just separate from your body and your body return to dust and your soul just floats off into the nether world of somewhere. No. 
When you die, there's a certain hope of life again. He will not abandon you to the grave because he did not allow his Holy One to see decay. And that means that when one day, because Jesus, who said, I am the resurrection and the life, when he raises you up, he will raise you spiritual and physical. He will raise you imperishable. Yes, you will have all the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in you, and you will be glorified inside and out with a truly visible physical body without limitation or without pain or disease or weakness. You will be just like Jesus glorified because of him who said, I am the resurrection and the life. And you know that's what that means. It's God's stamp of approval. The empty tomb. Oh, Pilate's seal couldn't keep it closed because this was God's stamp of approval that he has acquitted the world of all of its sin, that it is paid in full. Christ is the one who was appointed to be the sacrifice. And because he rose again back to life, that means your sin and my sin, they are forgiven, forgotten. We are redeemed and restored. Now think of it. If he didn't rise, he wouldn't have forgiveness. And if he didn't rise, you wouldn't have the hope of heaven. And if Jesus didn't rise, then all the Old Testament prophecies that de depict in striking detail not only his life and death, but his resurrection, they would be wrong. And that means Jesus, who predicted his life and death and resurrection, that he'd be a liar too. And that means our faith, it would be in vain. And that means that the best you could hope for is, well, eat a handful of, of some nice jelly beans and crack an egg and, and laugh and have a good time while you can because once you're dead, you're gone. No, we have so much more. We have a tomb that is empty, which means we have a hope that is full. And it does not disappoint because God has claimed us as his own Jesus did not die in vain, and our faith and hope is not in vain. No, he has arisen, and he burst forth from his three-day prison. And that means our sins are forgiven, and that means God has claimed us as his own, and that means heaven is our home. And that's what Jesus meant when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He said it not just for you and me. He said it for those that hated him, too. What of the Sanhedrin? Enemy number one. Those who were a little bit suspicious and curious of Jesus at first, but then after a while, they were out for blood. They understood. I think they understood the sign of Jonah, just as Jonah was in the belly of the, of the fish. So the Son of Man grave. Destroy this temple. They understood. They didn't believe. And what of Lazarus? I mean, that is the last miracle Jesus performed. His greatest. It not only foreshadowed his resurrection, but our own. And when we look at John's gospel, it's interesting because the chief priests after Lazarus is raised from the dead, what do they scheme and plot to do? To kill Lazarus. Lazarus was living proof, walking around the former dead, walking around as true life. Pinch me, see? Proof that Jesus doesn't lie. And it's a rather sad commentary on the hardness of their hearts. The Sanhedrin, they just kept rising up like a bad penny, didn't they? Jesus would scold them. He'd ridicule them. He would even try to call them out. You blind guides, you cheats, and you charlatans. He tried to use the law to break their stubborn hearts. Will you realize you need to be born again in me? Water in the Spirit, you have cast off the old work righteous ways of Judaism. Trust in the promise as it always has been given and is now revealed in me, who is the way, the truth, and the life. But in their blind zeal, they would not. And each time they became more stubborn and hell-bent on Jesus' destruction. Stop at nothing. So destroy Lazarus. Yeah, kill him. 
That'll stop all of his resurrection and life teaching. No, better yet, destroy Jesus, kill him, and that'll take all the hope out of his believers and his followers' hearts. And you know what? In their blind zeal, they thought they were going to solve the problem, but they actually ended up accomplishing what needed to happen. Jesus had to die in order to rise again, just as he promised. And yes, the proof was all around them. They even had walking among them the latest candidate that the good shepherd had snatched from the valley of death. But I'm also reminded of another place in Scripture that says, even if someone would come from the back, back from the dead, there are those who will not believe. Do you realize why God allowed us to have the Bible? Why the Holy Spirit allowed his words to be written down, 66 books for us to have, for us to study, written down, recorded, and then copied and recopied and stored and preserved in meticulous detail. Why? So that we could drag our kids through this awful torture called confirmation class? No. No. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. And by believing, you may have life in his name. Oh, John says there are so many things Jesus said and did that aren't recorded in this book. And all the books of the world, I suppose, wouldn't have enough room to record them all. But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and by believing you may have life in his name. Jesus did so many miraculous things. He taught and he spoke as one with authority, and he had the power to perform miracles and signs and wonders. And yes, the people were amazed. But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, and by believing you may have life in his name. That's what this day is all about. And when you walk through the Bible, you see Jesus proclaiming that. The 40 days after his resurrection unto his ascension, he visits with his disciples again and again, proving again and again, I am alive. Not some cadaver on a table in a medical examination room, but no, a warm invitation. Come, put your fingers here. See my side? Yeah, that's where the spear pierced my heart. But it's beating, and it's alive. I am alive. Convincing proofs without a doubt. But you know what? These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. And by believing, you may have life in his name. That's the reality of Easter, the truth. We still live in a world full of decay, a world of problem and hurt, heartache, a world where it seems the love of a lot is growing cold. But you know what? It's not always going to be that way. Even Lazarus, though resurrected, he would die again, whether by natural causes or through scandal and murder. But that's okay. Because while he wasn't raised that time imperishable, the day would come when he would be. And the day will come when you will be too. And these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. And by believing, you may have life in his name. That he is the resurrection and the life. That his empty tomb provides the cure for death. So thank God with me today that his son Jesus Christ donated his body unto death only to take it back again. And thank God that as we declare Christ's resurrection as a true convincing proof, you also declare your own resurrection in him. And it's all because of the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. And then who added, because I live, you will live also. He is risen. 
He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We gather our thank offerings. However large or small you've brought them out of your heart and out of the resources of your wealth, whether you bring them and place them in a plate or you bring them online, we ask that 